So nobody below the age of 45 is watching television, right? And if they are watching TV content, it's not on a TV device. And 20 years from now, the only place that you're ever gonna find a TV set is an antique store, right? That's what we keep hearing in our industry. However, this panel discussion will likely make you rethink those assumptions. We're gonna discuss the new life of the living room, which is a global study that was commissioned by all three companies, SmartClip, Archeolab Connect, NBC Universal. And what we ultimately found and what we wanna to present to you today is that the television is actually far from being an antique device. And the future of TV is in fact still TV. So let's do a quick intro round. I'll, I'll go first. My name is Sheer Leffel. I am the Executive Director of Marketing and Product Education at SmartClip. I'm Daniel. I'm the Chief Marketing and Operations Officer at, at Connect. My name is Kami Cronin. I'm the SVP of Global Ad Sales Strategy at NBC Universal. Hi, good morning. I'm Sebastian Busse. I'm Director ATV at Addressable TV at SmartClip. All right. So before we jump into the findings, Daniel, could you uh, walk us through the background, the, the rationale and the purpose of the study? Sure, with pleasure. I, I think uh, talking about the living room, when you're sitting outside at the beach in Cannes and it's like 35 degrees Celsius, it's a little bit awkward, but we remember uh, the living room, right? And uh, everybody does and everybody has one. And uh, with this study, we really wanted to, you know, coming out of this pandemic, uh, we wanted to understand what actually changed, right? So, you know, a lot of studies, if you look at the industry focusing on technology or focusing on ad spends or focusing on, on some kind of uh, technical aspect. But with this study, our aim was really to, to see what is the common denominator in our industry that we have to look at in order to derive the right insights for advertisers and agencies to take the right investment decisions. And if you boil it really down, it comes to the, um, the user, the, the behavior of each and every one of you and how that changed and how that evolved during the pandemic and how the space, the living room space became again, let's say, a focal point for the families, for the entertainment, for the work, for the fights, a lot of fights at my family in the living room, um, and, and all of that stuff. So the approach here was really to to look at the human beings and the user and the consumer and how she and he changed during the pandemic in terms of media consumption. Fantastic. And what would you say is the, is the main differentiator of the study? I think we, we really try to, uh, you know, when, when, when we set out uh, uh, together with SmartClip and later with our uh, friends from NBCU, uh, we really tried to find a good mix of methodology that captures this essence of the living room, right? So finally, we went out and we had did a big quantitative survey across 10 countries in Europe. And uh, we did some very in-depth interviews um, in core countries to understand the qualitative side of, of what people feel media consumption is, showing their living room pictures, stuff like that. All right. And, and we actually expanded the, the research to four more countries. So, so we saw 14, we collated data from 14 different countries. Sebastian, any global trends that were identified? Yeah, definitely. There's the three obvious ones uh, I would like to point out. I mean, first of all, definitely we see a, um, a massive increase in smart TV ownership. So when we look at the US, there's 80% of uh, people that own smart TVs. The same uh, roughly goes for Europe, where we uh, roughly see 70% of homes and people own smart TVs. When you look at uh, certain countries, it's even higher, obviously. Uh, I think Germany, uh, UK are the countries with the highest smart TV penetration. So literally everybody has a smart TV at home. And they love these smart TVs. That's the uh, second point. They embrace the connection features and uh, access points to different contents they have. Either it be linear, traditional, of course, and obviously, but also all the um, versatile apps and services they have, all these on-demand services and 
um, uh, products they have with these smart TVs. And then in the end, what is being consumed on these smart TVs, on the big screens, in the living room, in fact, is video. That's what the living room and what the study shows, and which is uh, pretty logic when you look at the TV, people want to consume video on the big screen, sit down, lean back, enjoy, and get entertained by premium video content on their smart TVs. Cami, any notable differences between the United States and Europe? Yeah, there were some um, some pretty stark differences. I always um, knew, you know, we in the US, TV has really been a staple in our living room, and we are, um, we consume a lot of video content, but the differences between what was in the Europe was what was in Europe versus the U.S. were very drastic. So even looking at AVOD penetration being about 19% in Europe versus like 51% in the U.S., SVOD 80% versus like 25%, and smart TV ownership even was about 55% versus you know 75%. And so I those were pretty striking for me that the differences were so big. Um, but we, we love our television, we love our video content, um, so not entirely surprising. Okay. What would you say is the most surprising result? I would say there were a couple things that were um, pretty surprising. Um, when I was going through the research, kind of looking at, um, at the young European viewers, um, 18 to 34s, they um, have a 91% penetration of SVOD services, it's primarily Netflix. However, then when you look at their openness to advertising and tolerance and openness to being targeted, it was much higher than any of the other groups. So I think that's great news for all of us. That's certainly great news for Netflix as they come onto the advertising scene. But I think that's great news for all of us because it's on the big screen. We're there. It's premium content and it's audiences that we want, that our marketers want. And I would say the other big difference for me was um, also the openness being targeted by the US. Um, so young people in Europe and Americans have a higher tolerance of ads and openness being targeted. But based on everything that we're working on in terms of addressability and making sure data, we're data driven and we're getting to the right consumers, I think that's great news for all of us. Daniel, what was the most surprising for you? I think there are a couple of uh, uh, really good nuggets, as you said before, right, in that, in that study. So one would definitely be that we also asked consumers, um, are you watching more video on the big screen after this pandemic or less, right? And if you look at the data, it's super obvious that all through the bank, all of the age groups watch more. But the young audiences, especially like over 30%, of the respondents said they're actually watching more video on the big screen, right? That's one. This is uh, closely linked to the uh, device penetration, right? So we, we, we heard about the smart TVs. In the last two years, 65% of the young respondents that we asked in Europe bought a new smart TV set, right? So there's a lot of new devices out there, and especially the younger audiences are really engaged with the the big screen, and that's where we also see that um, the magic happens on the big screen, finally. The family comes together in the living room. It's not only the, the content and the, um, the device, but also the moment, the, the mood, that really makes it a, uh, a special medium. Sebastian, from a tech perspective, what was the most surprising result for you? Yeah, I can uh, add to some of Kemi's points, and that goes into the direction of advertising. Uh, people obviously embrace personalization on their screens, and that goes hand in hand with personalization of their ads. I mean, they understand, people understand and see uh, that these smart TVs are connected, that there are some uh, data points and connections behind it. So it seems that they uh, see it very positive to actually uh, receive then also on the big screen personalized ads. That's obviously what they already are used to on all the other digital devices. And uh, with that data we see now, it's uh, pretty logic and a big opportunity for us to further extend that into advertising products on the big, big screen. So personalization is really something uh, which is key. So let's discuss some of the main challenges that we uncovered and discuss some, some possible solutions. Daniel, what were the top three advertising challenges? Well, I guess 
you know, again, coming from the consumer, from the from the user we looked at, um, you first, you know, you have to understand what are the expectations from the consumer towards that big screen, right? So a lot of them, they want it, you know, it needs to be bigger, it needs to be better, it needs to be smarter, right? And that, that, um, that moment of smartness and the connection, right? And we heard it from Sebastian. Uh, we have uh, over 72% uh, of the uh, TV sets are connected in, in Europe, right? So leveraging that connection from an advertiser point of view is a great opportunity, right? You have a, a massive penetration of those devices out there, but it also means you need to watch out, you know, what is the acceptance of ads and uh, what is the um, likability of the content? How do, you, how do you tap into that, right? Because at the end of the day, as an advertiser, what you look for is a connection to a possible consumer that buys your product. And you want to have it in the best moment and in the best place possible, which is the living room, but then you have to see how can I get that? Like what what is the the partners, the the, the formats, linear, non-linear that I can leverage in order to to make the most out of it, right? So in terms of some of the behavioral challenges that we uncovered, so our research revealed that 80% of Europeans and Americans reported turning to their mobile device to consume more content uh, until they're during TV commercial breaks, uh, until their TV program came back on. Um, so Cami, knowing this, how can advertisers be everywhere the consumer goes? I think it's about being, um, re being really smart with your distribution. And I would say one thing we've done really well at NBCU is making sure we are everywhere where the consumer is. So we have our content distributed on all of our, we have 300 ed points, but all of the platforms. Um, it's also making sure that you lean into adjacent content experiences that are on other platforms, so whether they're on social, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Um, so that in those breaks, you know, it's a continuation of the experience. Um, it's also leaning into kind of new commercial formats and, and having e-commerce, kind of less intrusive ads, which I'll know we'll talk about in a minute, but um, it's about the ad experience as well. Daniel, can you tell us a little bit more about the battle of attention and how? Yeah, that's actually a topic we're going to discuss with uh, uh, Karen Nelson Field tomorrow, right? I mean, uh, attention has really been a key word and it has become, you know, through Karen's work, uh, a bit of a new metric that we're trying to uh, uh, look at. Because at the end of the day, what you're trying to create is that connection. The connection needs to have impact, right? And the impact is very closely linked to the attention the, the screen delivers, right, or gets. And the bigger the screen, the bigger the attention. And uh, on top of that, uh, but she, she'll discuss that tomorrow, they also looked at um, certain medias having certain attention elasticity, meaning that if you're watching something on a big screen and it's a, a shitty content, a shitty ad, for example, right, you're still more open to the next ad and to receive it positively. Whereas on smaller screens and different media and platforms, if you, if you have a bad ad experience, you tend more likely to find the next one equally bad, whether it's good or not, right? So attention has really become a key metric and a key focus for us to look at because it's so closely linked to the big screen. So this isn't so surprising. So our research revealed that roughly 30% of Americans find advertisements to be annoying, irrespective of whether it's linear TV or catch up. Cami, uh, when it comes to consumer experience, how do you make ads less annoying? Um, that has been a huge area of focus for our company. Um, I, in the US, we over-index on the amount of advertising time on linear, um, as well as digital versus um, the European market. But we know that if the ad experience is not what consumers want, they're going to leave. And we've seen it in the data. And so we've been on a multi-year journey to understand kind of what is the right amount of ads for our consumers, but that also work for clients as well. And so we've done a lot, a lot of testing. And I think even at the launch of Peacock kind of took the best of our testing, our learnings, um, where we found that you know, they didn't want a lot of ads, but clients don't want a lot of ads there either because it's a lot of clutter. Um, so we had tested on linear a, um, a unit called the Prime Pod, which is 60 seconds. It's two elements. Um, and it's kind of the first break. It's 
too short to fast forward your DVR to. Um, and the ad experience was great for consumers, um, as well as clients uncluttered for clients. And we then made that the basis of our Peacock advertising experience. So it was no more than five minutes, five prime pods. Um, but it's then innovating on that. Um, and that is kind of like where we've really doubled down is on ad innovation. So I think it's really about the ad innovation, and, but making sure that it works for both the consumer and the client. Um, because you need the consumers to be there and you want the marketers to follow and they want to be around kind of the IP and they want to be the, where the consumers are. But if it doesn't work for either, then you're not going to win. So interestingly enough, Europeans found ads to be even more bothersome. So it was around more than 50% actually were annoyed by advertisements, also irrespective of where they saw the, 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 the video ad. Sebastian, how can you tackle it from a tech perspective? Yeah, I mean, that's uh, probably one of our key topics and core focus at SmartClip to uh, provide a platform which uh, allows for products that blend data with innovative ad formats and then in the end uh, not see, for example, traditional broadcast and digital video, for example, as siloed approaches and siloed worlds, but rather to really blend these worlds uh, together, so to say, have them sit on one platform, and then by that achieving what uh, Cami just mentioned, um, control ad load frequency, and then come to a much bigger efficiency in the end also uh, for the advertisers, and uh, most of all prevent ad fatigueness or bad perception on uh, the client perspective or consumer perspective. I, w I would jump in and say on that, like it's the marriage of like the tech, right, and the creative, and making sure there are controls in place because you don't want repetitive ads. You don't want sometimes what we sometimes call as schlocky ads. You want to make sure that like the creative is hitting your marks and the quality is there, um, and that's where the technology is just so important. Exactly right, and that also puts you in the in the position to improve the creatives. Like think about how why does that ad and why does that creative didn't perform well, do we also think about improving the um, creative as it's, yeah, as it looks? Is it the look? Is it the design? That's also what we are looking into. Exactly. Yeah, it's funny that you mentioned repetition. That was another common theme in the study. Uh, so, so people were frustrated by seeing the same ad over and over. What kind of targeting capabilities or solutions are available on the big screen to help with, with this? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, the, it's the basic features that we all know from the digital world, like frequency capping is the most obvious one, but then again, to really connect that also uh, with the traditional TV world, where uh, these kind of targeting metrics and KPI measurements didn't exist uh, until recently, I would say, but that's now what we can really use in terms of control and uh, preventing these uh, bad perceptions. Okay, so it's time to wrap it up. Daniel, what are the key takeaways from the research? Well, I think from our perspective, what we saw is really like there's, a, there's an explosion of content, there's an explosion of connection possibilities, touch points with the consumer in the living room. The big screen is the screen that rules them all when it comes to video. And I might add that consuming video is among the top three activities of all Europeans, except the Germans. They like to, it is on fourth place, they have gardening before that. But for everybody else, video is a, a substantial part of their lives, right? And the living room offers a unique possibility to tap into those, to, you know, to invite yourself as a brand into those lives and to understand how can, you know, how can you talk to them? In order to do that, you need to tackle those challenges. You need to tackle the quality and the ad load and the targeting and uh, the fatigueness, and you need to have the technology to make that happen, right? But I think, in general, if you look at it, there's a, it's a huge opportunity um, for advertisers to tap into their living room and the big screen. And I think in the, in the years to come, we will see more and more how technology will help us to bridge that <coughs> Connect, to make that connection and to help advertisers to tap into that. Thanks. Would you like to share any of our plans moving forward with the research? Yes, of course. So we're very excited to have uh, uh, the US uh, results somewhere in September analyzed and 
we're going to make sure to make a big bang and to, to uh, uh, talk to the market about it. I personally feel that this is really like uh, a perfect marriage, you know, looking at the US. If, you, if you're here in Cannes in France, we always look to the US as a you know, point of reference when it comes to what's going to happen in the next couple of months or years here in, in Europe. But vice versa, I think for the uh, US clients and agencies, you know, it's really hard to understand Europe, right? Because it's so fragmented, it's so different. And having a, a very thorough look at how consumers act and, and, and think across Europe is, I think, a, a great added value yeah, to no, your clients. No, it's invaluable for us as well. Yeah, there's a lot of learnings both ways. So we'd love to reciprocate. So I think that will be really the next step to, uh, uh, to launch the, the US results and to make sure that we talk to the market on both sides of the uh, Atlantic. And then from our perspective, this is something we want to investigate continuously, ongoing, looking at how does behavior change and, and how can we tap into that and how can we make that accessible for our advertisers and agencies that work with us. All right. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for Thank your you. attention.